Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Peter Knox. I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities here at Case Western Reserve University. And we're very pleased to see all of you here for the third and final Walter A. Strauss lecture in the humanities. Um, we've uh, enjoyed uh, two lectures earlier this week by our distinguished guest, Professor Priya Satya from Stanford University, as she has examined the ethical compromises that have been used to justify violence throughout history, taking uh, case examples from uh, the Galton family and gun manufacturer in 18th century Britain and British air control uh, in the Middle East in the period between the two world wars. This evening, she's going to explore some of the ethical complications that accompanied the partition of South Asia into Pakistan and India in 1947. And here to introduce her this evening uh, is my colleague from the Department of History, Professor Ananya Dasgupta. Uh, she joined the faculty here at CWRU in 2013 from the University of Pennsylvania, where she did her graduate work. She is a specialist in South Asian history, focusing on India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh and far more qualified than me to tell you what you're about to listen to. So please invite her to the podium. Thank you, Peter. That was a very generous introduction. And uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor to welcome all of you to this final lecture of the Strauss series. And as uh, many of you may already know, Professor Satya has been here this entire week. And uh, I hope she has had a chance to sample our vibrant intellectual community, especially those of us who are deeply committed to learning and teaching the humanities here. And at the heart of our community is the Baker Nod Center for Humanities. And I cannot stress quite enough how much the center does to promote nurture and strengthen the love of the humanities, the quest for knowledge, and a spirit of critical inquiry. It is a center with a vision that is broad and inclusive. The Strauss Lecture Series is only one, but a significant testimony to its vision. Uh, I thank the center on behalf of all of us for giving us this opportunity to hear Professor Satya's revetting and probing lectures that inform us about the past and help us interrogate the present. Today's lecture, titled The Self-Divided, The Partition of 1947, in light of a momentous event in South Asian history, will explore how a moment of decolonization and the making of new nation states was marked by terrible violence and unprecedented scale of human displacement and also a very significant change, I think it would be right to say, in the social fabric of modern South Asia. We thank Professor Satya for being here, and we give her a big hand. Good evening, everybody. It's been monsoon weather because we're talking about India, right? <laughs> I brought that with me, it's special effects. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you again to the Baker Nord Center for having me, for, to Peter for arranging uh, all the events this week, and Maggie, of course, uh, as well, uh, who is the wizard, I think, of behind the scenes. And um, thank you for that great introduction, Ananya, and thank you all for coming out. Um, this is newer material for me that I'm presenting in a little bit um, more in the South Asian direction than the British uh, subjects that I usually work on. So if I am presuming that you know something um, and, and, know, and you feel like you and maybe others don't know, would you just stop me? And I think it might help everyone. Like if I name, if I say Gandhi and, and you feel like no one knows who that is, just, just stop and I'll give a little, a little I'm, I'm saying Gandhi because I'm pretty sure everyone knows Gandhi, but there may be other things I'm assuming. Okay, so ju just to begin. Okay, so the partition of South Asia into Pakistan and India in 1947 triggered the biggest human migration in history. And it was accompanied by horrific violence. And uh, just to give you some figures, 12 to 15 million people moved, and between a half to two million people were killed. And what I'm going to do now is just show you a series of photographs for those of you who aren't familiar with the event. And I apologize in advance. Some of them are 
quite graphic, but it will give you a sense of what we're talking about and what we're trying to explain. So this is just to situate us geographically. Can you speak in the microphone, please? Well, I can't. I won't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> All right. Um, here, let me try. Yeah, I'll try this. Thank you. All right. So um, can, is this working? Yeah. So from here, you can just see the, the arrows are just showing the directions in which people are moving. Basically, you have this vast British India that is um, in itself something of a patchwork because there are independent princely states throughout this region which are not shown here, but I'll show you some later. And then and in 1947, West Pakistan and East Pakistan together make up this country, Pakistan. They're divided by 1,000 miles of Indian territory. Okay? And then later in the 1970s, there's a civil war, and East Pakistan becomes Bangladesh. Okay? And here are just pictures taken by a Life magazine uh, photographer who was there at the time. People moving by bullet cart, by train, by foot. The refugee camps that had to be set up instantly. And you know, some of these cities, like Delhi, grew by 40% overnight. And some of the impact of that sudden overnight growth is you know, why Delhi still you know, looks the way it does now. Right? It's not something that a city can re recover from. This is in Delhi. Now, a few pictures of the violence. Okay, So this is a village set on fire, um, an aerial photograph of that. Sorry about the quality. Bodies, you know, uh, along the train tracks. This is in Punjab. Uh, left unburied, uncremated, and then mass burials afterwards by volunteers. Uh, you know, dismembered bodies. People passing where people have already passed and, and been killed. Uh, burning, this is arson, some, a car being burnt. Okay. I'm going to leave it on this image rather than the violent image. Okay, um, So let's get to the questions in the story now. So you may be familiar. Some of you, I think, have actually, I was talking to a gentleman before who's actually there. So there are different degrees of familiarity with these grisly images of trains appearing full of bodies, people dismembered or burnt in front of their children, women raped and mutilated, sometimes entire um, populations of villages executed, families killing their own women, or women ki committing suicide to escape rape, the shame of rape, or conversion. This violence was not haphazard. It was systemic. And complicity was very wide. It was committed, in most cases, by paramilitary groups that were composed of former soldiers and well-trained young men these are gangs with machine guns in jeeps. Um, they were efficient bodies who took the shame, honor, and protection of their communities into their own hands with the support of those communities. So how did this violence on an unprecedented scale come to pass? How did neighbors become enemies? Was it momentary insanity? Was there rational political intent? Was it motivated by fear? Uh, by peer pressure, by ideology, by a desire for loot? Um, and what was the role of the departing British rulers? And how have Indians, Pakistanis, and the British dealt with the burden of conscience about this violence? What is the psychic inheritance of the trauma of partition? So those are the kinds of questions I want to grapple with. Um, so let's start with the British. So most British narratives of the end of empire in India tend to emphasize the kind of the ceremonial transfer of power in 1947, August 15th, August 14th and 15th, 1947, as a fulfillment of the paternalistic goals of British imperialism. And that's what this photo of the last viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, looking up at the, the changing of the flag you know, in Delhi. Um, and the fact that there was violence going on between Indians you know, while this ceremonial transfer of power is occurring, 
merely proved that the steadying British hand was what had kept a lid on the native Indian tendency towards anarchy. But in fact, the violence was directly shaped by the colonial context in which it erupted and the decolonizing context in which it erupted. Of course, even before the British had come to South Asia, there had been times of conflict uh, between different religious communities, but the violence of partition was something new. Uh, religious identity had been transformed by the experience of empire. It was about very modern notions of difference, not ancient hatreds. And to understand those modern notions of difference, we need to go back a little bit in time. So we're in now 1857, almost 100 years earlier. At that time, uh, there was a massive rebellion in South Asia. And the British crushed it with a great deal of difficulty. And after this, they were determined to do what they could to design policy in such a way that Indians would not form a block united against them again. So fear of rebellion starts to shape colonial social engineering. And here is just an image of some of the kinds of punishments that the British um, uh, took out against uh, Indian rebels. So thousands of rebels were shot from the mouths of cannon after this rebellion. Um, so there was this real determination to never let this happen again. Now, we've talked in the previous lecture. How many here were at the previous lecture? because there are some references to that. OK, good, a few of you. Um, so Orientalists, British Orientalists, had been uh, involved in the construction of um, British rule and ad administration in India from the beginning. And they had long guided uh, an effort to codify Indian religions in a new way so that the British could feel that they n knew the population they were ruling, right? So they have to codify religion since they're coming in as outsiders and then administer uh, religious law that way. So for the British, from the British point of view, Indian religion was a fixed and mutually exclusive badge of identity, even though in fact, um, religious identity was often something very quite fluid and locally determined. Um, so the British tied South Asian political identity to religious, linguistic, and caste distinctions and built those into the colonial state uh, and its administrative infrastructure through things like maps and censuses, even public infrastructure. So to give you an example, this is, you know, train stations would have separate Muslim and Hindu uh, refreshment rooms and water taps, and this is a case of a, a Hindu tea stall in one train station. So now European Orientalist notions shaped Indian study of religion as well. Okay, and I'll just give you one instance. This is Muhammad Iqbal, Alama Iqbal, he's also known as, who was the poet and philosopher who's often credited with inspiring the movement for Pakistan in the 1930s. Now, in 1905, he went to Europe to study. And he went in the steps of his teacher, a teacher he had in uh, Lahore, who was called Thomas Walker Arnold, who was an Orientalist scholar. And Arnold was going back to England to take up um, other administrative jobs in the India office there. And he went on to this uh, very um, elite career uh, in Indian governance, but in London. But uh, Iqbal followed him to, to Europe. And he goes to Germany, he goes to England, and he starts researching Islamic mysticism. And he concludes that Islamic mysticism, the kind that most Muslims in India would practice, didn't really have a foundation in real Islam, in original Islam, and that it was an, kind of an, un, uh, an alien growth and perhaps even unhealthy. And he became interested in the potential of real Islam as a kind of social and political organization, as a way of organizing society. So what the point is that scholarly conventions at the time made it difficult for anyone to understand questions about Islam's role in the world outside of European Orientalism. And the same applies for studying uh, Hinduism as well. Now, Iqbal's ideas were much supported by his best friend in Lahore, who was this man, Muhammad Asad. Now, Asad, just to draw a link with the previous lecture, is a figure who was a figure very similar to the sorts of men that we studied in, we talked about in Wednesday's lecture. He was actually born Leopold Weiss, 
He was um, an Austro-Hungarian Jew, and he converted to Islam, and he was an advisor to the Saudi government in the 1920s. He had a fight with Saud, and he left and came to Lahore. And he wound up staying in uh, post-independent Pakistan and uh, served in the Pakistani foreign ministry. And I'm invoking him to highlight, again, the kind of colonial intellectual context in which the idea of a Muslim nation state took shape, necessarily. Right? So British ideas about uh, Indian religion mattered uh, in a new way after 1909. At that time, the British responded to intense anti-colonial activity by finally allowing some Indian participation in local governance. And they created electorates to elect Indian officials to government. But those electorates were based on religion. There were separate electorates for Hindus and separate electorates for Muslims. And once those electorates were framed by religion, all the attendant forms of political association uh, and communication um, from political parties to newspapers and so on were also framed according to religion. They had to be. And that tended to harden differences. Now, in the interwar period, the British controlled much of the Middle East, we know from the previous lecture. And this also shaped their attitude towards Indian Muslims. With the rise of that intuitive expert that I described in the last lecture, the old imperial habit of sort of bemoaning the anarchic disunity of Muslims who were hopelessly divided by sect yielded to more paranoid fears of kind of telepathic unity amongst all Muslims across these vast deserts of Asia. In this view, a mistake with Indian Muslims would reverberate all over the empire. It would risk their position in Iraq and Jordan and so on. So this sort of Islamophobic background is essential also to understanding the creation of Pakistan. Partition was also part of Britain's decolonization toolkit. Um, it was something they had already used in Ireland and that they were proposing at the same time uh, as a solution in Palestine. And sometimes the same officials were moving from context to context and bringing this idea with them. Um, so what, in summary, what we're seeing here is that first there's the colonial ordering of societies by fixing religious identities, and then there's the colonial division of land based on those identities, an attempt to sort of make irrationally, seemingly irrationally mixed populations uh, more kind of rationally laid out in space. And the British priority for decolonization was that whatever new entity emerged in South Asia, it just must be something that will stay in the Commonwealth. Right? They want to ensure continuity of the imperial order so that perhaps independence doesn't have to mean so very much. Um, and partition was fully compatible with that vision. In fact, both Pakistan and India were initially dominion states of the Commonwealth, as it's announced. I'm sorry that the image is a little truncated, but that was the best one I could find. Um, so Britain clearly bears significant responsibility for the fact of partition. But what about the violence that accompanied it? And in the next part where I talk about the violence, I'm going to lean a bit on the work of Yasmin Khan, which I recommend to you. So first, I think we need to recall uh, the Bengal famine of 1943, which is generally now agreed to have been a man-made famine that resulted from British uh, grain distribution policies during World War II. Um, and this famine killed more people than partition itself. Um, there were many photographs of this event. Again, um, apologies for the graphic nature. Um, but so many people died, three million people died in this uh, famine that it, in Bengal, it dramatically compromised Bengal's ability to cope with the next traumatic event and all that vast movement of people. Now, when the violence of um, partition began, British cultural beliefs about Hindus and Muslims ensured that uh, the British adopt a sort of passive position. They had a fatalistic approach to the violence. So for instance, in Benares uh, in North India in 1946, the British district magistrate simply assumed that the city would be burnt down and that Hindus and Muslims will, quote, fly at each other's throats. And with that outlook, it made sense for him to prioritize planning his own departure rather than taking measures to prevent that violence. So such fatalistic thinking underwrote hasty withdrawal of resources and manpower ensured that, uh, and ensured that the British conscience nevertheless remained easy. 
Once British aims were secured, in fact, London officials paid little attention to Indian daily life. Instead, they were preoccupied with the Cold War, with British balance sheets, with the safety of maybe British civilians in India, with Britain's international reputation as it's losing its jewel in the crown, uh, with challenges coming up in Greece and in Palestine. So at every turn, they're actually speeding up events uh, towards uh, decolonization in India. And the Br Indian public is constantly stunned with announcements about the accelerated calendar. And that in itself made violent partition more and more unavoidable. And here's a picture of Lord Mountbatten with the countdown calendar behind him, 11 days to departure. In the summer of 1947, the British army began to depart just when India's own army was being divided and could not be relied on to control the violence. So in Punjab, while the trouble was unfolding, the British command confined, confined troops to barracks and evacuated them as quickly as they could. Confidential instructions insisted that British army units had no operational functions except to save British lives in emergency. Instead, the British created something called the Punjab Boundary Force, which lasted a mere 32 days from August 1st to September 1st, 1947, when it was disbanded out of ineffectualness. It was too small and too thinly distributed. Hasty dismantling of the imperial state not only made it harder to address the violence, it also made much of the violence possible in the first place. The British administration withdrew provincial control as eager Indian leaders seized that control after provincial elections early in 1946. The imperial state shed its law and order capacity and its sense of responsibility, offering little support to administrators trying to deal with routine local politics. The British aim was simply to cut losses by avoiding investing any more in India's infrastructure. So intelligence units, for instance, were run down, and that meant that local officials had less and less information and less warning to cope with threats of violence. The government also stopped counting people right when information of that type was most needed in order to draw the best line uh, and divide the populations. So people in the subcontinent obviously made their own history. They bear responsibility for the killing uh, and the violence they engaged in. But as Marx would say, they did not make their own history in circumstances of their own choosing. Right? Um, colonial sociology shaped their outlook, and imperial indifference created a climate of insecurity that could not but give rise to violence. So that's the British. What about the Indians? What about the emphasis on nonviolence in the Indian independence movement? How did the same people commit these unconscionable acts, leaving bodies unburied and uncremated, which is perhaps the most obvious sign of total civilizational breakdown? Again, I think the context of war and the transfer of power mattered immensely. During the war, much of the Congress party, everyone OK with Congress party? sort of the mainstream uh, nationalist movement that Gandhi was the head of, and Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru, who becomes the first prime minister, is the head of, okay, the main mainstream nationalist movement. So they're jailed for most of World War II because they launched this movement called the Quit India Movement. And what happens, well, 60,000 party workers are jailed. And that leaves the field open for um, parties that are more willing to uh, either combat the British directly, violently, or to um, work with the British. So rival parties like the Muslim League, which is the party that's demanding uh, Pakistan, at this point, and, the, and a right-wing Hindu party called the Hindu Mahasabha, they flourish during the war and do much better. And in, at the same time, from Southeast Asia, uh, a military force called the Indian National Army uh, starts to be, gain a lot of fame uh, for fighting against the British alongside uh, the Japanese Army. And this is a picture of Subhash Chandra Bose, who is the leader of the Indian National Army, standing with uh, a bunch of uh, Japanese politicians during the war at a conference summit, so he's the man at the very far end. So after the war, when the Congress leaders come out of jail, their commitment to nonviolence is, is immediately diluted because they're belatedly trying to latch on to these other kinds of movements that have become popular, particularly the, the cause of the Indian National Army. Now, the war also had given many Indians violent experiences. Disgruntled soldiers who had fought for Britain were recruited into new military and police units and new defense groups and volunteer bodies forming across the north. Deserters joined such groups with their guns. And these groups often shared an imprint of Western fascism and race pride. So many of them even acknowledged the example of Hitler and the Nazis. <clears throat> 
Such groups would, they would hold rallies in uniforms with flags and attract students and youth and sometimes just um, uh, hardened criminals. Um, so uh, for instance, the members of the Hindu Mahasabha's Ram Sena, they would wear these khaki uniforms and wear orange caps and they would pledge to sacrifice in the, in the name of the, the Hindu cause. Um, some of these groups started as youth clubs or sports clubs. Some became very large, professionalized, well-organized, more like private militias. Um, the two most important are the RSS, the Rashtriya Svayam Sevak Sangh, which is a Hindu paramilitary volunteer organization still very powerful today. Uh, and its counterpart was the Muslim League National Guards, uh, pictured here. So from the British perspective, these armed groups pose no direct challenge to British interests, so they weren't terribly worried about them. Now, some provincial Indian politicians began to use these groups for policing as they shifted from being the opposition to the government to being the government. Um, and they're eager to show their power on the eve of independence. And now that wartime British repression of the nationalist movement is over, Indian politicians can roam freely, um, devise laws, spread propaganda in either the pro or anti-Pakistan cause. And police and other officials who had earlier feared showing their nationalist support right, when they were serving British masters, they're now openly allowed to celebrate particular Indian politicians who are associated with some party mission. And so they lose their image of neutrality as a result. So day-to-day -day life is increasingly being shaped, organized, uh, shaped by committees that are organized and divided along either league lines or Congress lines. And it's a very polarized atmosphere, and politicians' words also become overly incendiary, almost to the point of incitement. And these are the dynamics that were really clear after the cabinet mission negotiations of 1946. So in these negotiations, the Muslim League actually agreed to a proposed federal structure for independent India. So no Pakistan, just a federal structure. But the Congress party refused those, that proposal. They were very adamant to inherit the centralized imperial state that the British had created. So now uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, um, has to strengthen his hand, and he calls for direct action day on August 16, 1946, to kind of show the power behind the Pakistan idea, and he calls for a strike. Um, but it becomes a day of massive violence throughout northern India. And yes, I do have a terrible picture of vultures and bodies from that time. I'm just going to fast forward it because it's unbearable. Okay. The violence was organized uh, on this direct action day and enabled by a sense of immunity from the governing provincial party. In a Calcutta reeling from the famine and post-war unemployment, Muslims armed with sticks attended a meeting where the Muslim League's chief minister gave crowds the impression that the police and the military would not be called out. And when victims noticed that the police were not coming, they inferred that, the, uh, that these gangs were acting with the blessing of the League and the government. And they had, and these Hindu militias were waiting. I mean, they were ready to retaliate. So this carnage comes out on an unprecedented scale in a place that until that point had very strong regional patriotism uh, and, and a tradition of coalition government. Soon after this, in Punjab, uh, on the western side of North India, there's also a coalition provincial government, and they try to restrict militia activity in the province by banning the RSS and the Muslim League National Guards, but there's an uproar and they have to lift the ban within days. And that really shows the weakness of that government. So the evident breakdown of law and order produces paranoia and fear in everyday life. In this atmosphere, all forms of identification were subordinated to faith in a single political identity, which is your religion. And it's like, if you aren't with us, you're against us. That's the only, it's survival based on that. So it, it was against this tense backdrop that all the parties agreed to the partition plan in June 1947 without anticipating what it would entail and without offering assurance, much needed assurance, that citizenship, property, and lives would be guaranteed everywhere. Without such assurance and without information for two more months about where the boundary would fall, terror reigned in Bengal and Punjab. And there's a lot of testimony of extreme mental stress, people with their nerves on edge, living under curfew, the ominous sounds of drums, sirens, militia in the streets, uh, and all the decisions that were being made about which land and which infrastructure would go to which side, how substantive 
uh, the separation would be, whether people would move, uh, what would happen to big cities like Calcutta and Lahore. All these decisions were very hasty, very confused. No one knew what was going on. And so people start to move, and they move out of fear. Some are moving out of conviction. They believe in Pakistan. They believe in uh, India. Some are moving by accident. They happen to be traveling. They get stuck somewhere. And some people are being driven out systematically by these gangs. And the bureaucracies um, become increasingly dysfunctional because the officers who make them up are themselves thinking of migrating or trying to please their new masters or um, experiencing a lot of anxiety themselves. So officials were off, op, often openly partisan or simply not at their posts. And news of the army's division was a further blow in the midst of all this. Without army or civil services functioning, Punjab is held hostage by militias. And the government, having tried to suppress the militias, just now allows them to go free uh, without any other recourse. So as every community in every place feared becoming a persecuted minority, it made a kind of sense to wage a violent battle to preserve the land from intruders or outsiders. All the ingredients for ethnic cleansing were in place. A feeble polarized police force, the absence of troops, and a petrified well-armed population. So when the boundary award was finally announced, you know, leaders complained and that too sort of fueled the people's willingness to fight. This is just to show you how difficult it would be to draw a line in Punjab because the population is mixed everywhere. Um, so it was going to be criticized no matter what. But bitterly disappointed groups on the wrong side of the line fought to cleanse their areas, reverse the line, or rob it of meaning. Soldiers hearing of villages wiped out or their sisters being abducted deserted to join the militias. And besides guns and swords, they also had bombs that had been left over from the war. So in short, the violence of partition was not caused by religion. That's too easy. The exclusionary politics of that time, the scale of killing and grouping along religious lines were new. The violence marked the crumbling of an old order and abdication of responsibility for minorities by all those who had any kind of power. Now, the killing was clearly genocidal in some places, but there were also countless acts of heroism and generosity, and even after 1947, a deep desire to return home. Um, there are lots of reports of help and protection offered by strangers, neighbors, and friends of different faiths. And all this suggests that even while religious identification mattered in a new way, other kinds of moral communities survived. And that's what I want to talk about next. So violence temporarily forged national community, but contradictory allegiances related to class, caste, language, region, and so on endured. And that complicated the task of turning South Asians into Indians and Pakistanis. So colonial social engineering had layered a kind of zero or one sense of ident religious identity on top of these very, very complicated selves. So now we're going to go a little bit back in time to understand that complicated self uh, of the South Asian. So the nationalist struggle itself had been marked by efforts to move beyond nationhood. It's important to think of it more as an anti-colonial movement than a nationalist movement. Um, figures like Iqbal, who I mentioned, Gandhi, and other thinkers who witnessed the destructive power of nationalism in World War I were really trying to imagine and create alternative kinds of community. So that's why Iqbal was so interested in Islam as potentially a means of social and political organization. He was trying to get away from the nation. Leftists also saw India's uh, struggle as part of a wider revolutionary struggle. And the Russian Revolution of 1917 provided further inspiration for imagining a world that might be both post-colonial and post-national. So in fact, the Muslim League and Congress cooperated uh, significantly in what's known as uh, the Khilafat movement, uh, 1919 to 22, which was a struggle to preserve the Ottoman Caliphate, uh, which was uh, destroyed uh, effectively during World War I. This was another attempt to think beyond the nation. Here, they're jointly, you can see the Congress party flag and the Muslim League flag. They're burning clothes in the Swadeshi movement uh, during the Khilafat period. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of figures here. Hasrat Mohani, who was the leader of the Muslim League in the early 20s. He was a Muslim, but he also wrote devotional poems to Lord Krishna. He helped found the Indian Communist Party. Was he Muslim? Was he Hindu? Was he nationalist? Was he for which nation? Was he internationalist? Uh, 
Um, then there's the, another Muslim figure, the Khilafat leader Muhammad Ali Johar, who was presiding over Congress in 1923. And he envisioned a post-nationalist opportunity to create, I'm just going to read a part of this quote, a federation grander, nobler, and infinitely more spiritual than the United States of America. And then there was also an organization called the Hindustan Republican Association that was in the 1920s using violent tactics to actually try to create a United States of India. So this was the kind of revolutionary activity in the 20s that fueled British fears of Islamic Bolshevik conspiracy and the paranoid expansion of aerial policing that we talked about on Wednesday. But it shows us that South Asians were actually, in this period, managing complex and contradictory identities in very creative ways. You couldn't see partition coming you know, uh, from, from this uh, moment in the 1920s. So another example is uh, a man named Muhammad Majid, who was the vice chancellor of Jamia Millia University in New Delhi, a very anti-colonial university set up um, at the turn of the century. He was a staunchly pro-Congress figure. His social circle encompassed all religions. But in Delhi, he resolved that when he goes to the market, he's only going to buy Muslim to support his religious community. So he tries to do this, but pragmatism wins out because he finds that there are actually good and bad salesmen irrespective of religion. And the women in his house say, no, we're just going to buy things where we get the best service and from whoever has the best stuff. So the, that whole plan fails. Um, and sometimes you find managing contradiction producing some pretty ironic outcomes uh, before independence. So during World War II, as I mentioned, Congress is jailed. And you have the Muslim League and the Hindu Mahasabha flourishing. And there are two groups who are based on denying the compatibility of Indian Muslims and Hindus, right? And yet, they form successful coalition governments in three provinces during the war. So they're totally incompatible, yet they're totally compatible, right? They're almost mirror images of each other. Now, the notion of a divided self was something culturally deep in this region, um, part of religiously syncretic mystical notions of birha, B-I-R-H-A, Try to remember that word, which is the longing for union with the divine. And it's usually told through an allegory of worldly love. So now we're going to move a little bit into poetry to get at what I'm talking about with this cultural tradition. So the subject of Urdu poetry, which is read throughout the North, was a split subject. And just to give you a sense of that, i um, sharing two couplets with you. The first one is from the 18th century poet Mir. And it says, and you can, for those of you who don't know Urdu, just read the English. Um, and then in the 19th century, the poet Momin, Tum mere paas hote ho goya jab koi dusra nahi hota. So it's describing a, a self that is split. It's a Sufi uh, kind of outlook, right? Um, and Punjabi love kissas, um, which also become really popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, amplified this outlook. In the most well-known, the story of Heer and Ranja, the lovers Heer and Ranja die before the chance at union. And the message was that the most intense experience of union with the divine lies in interminable longing. And here are just some images of some of these kissas, Heer Ranja, Soni Mahival, um, and uh, Mirza Saiba, I think, are up there. I don't know how many of you will be familiar with these, but they're like staples in Punjabi culture, um, both sides of the border. Now, in these stories, the beloved is known as the Pardesi, which means someone abroad, okay? Uh, someone who lives somewhere else. And that's why there's a longing for union. That's the way you allegorize sort of a spiritual division in a, in a worldly sense. So this cultural outlook had long shaped responses to colonialism. You have to remember um, the Mughal court was a court of poets, right? The last Mughal emperor was himself a poet. Here he is here, um, Zafar. Um, and they nurtured a cult around a lost homeland as the Mughal star was eclipsed and the British star rose. So Urdu poetry evolved in the context of the worldly problem of colonialism and the crises of culture and identity it produced. The concept of birha at its heart fused worldly with unworldly concerns. As Punjab became a primary site for recruitment into the British Indian Army, and many Punjabis escaped British rule by moving to North America, the longing for erotic or spiritual union morphed into a longing for home, for the desh that the Pardesi has left behind. And here are just a few images of Punjabis in the early, uh, the first waves of Punjabis who moved to California, just to give you a sense. 
uh, and this is some of the literature they were putting out in multiple scripts. The poet Tagore visited them in Canada in 1929. Um, so many of India's nationalist leaders studied and lived abroad, like Gandhi, Nehru, Iqbal, and so on, that the Pardesi sentiment was common to their patriotism too, writing about the homeland as a beloved, right, that you're separated from. When the Punjabi revolutionary Bhagat Singh who was pictured here in jail. Um, he and his companions launched a hunger strike in prison in 1929. 5,000 supporters gathered in a park in Amritsar to recite poems that compared their love of country to the story of Hira and Ranja. That was the idiom through which they understood patriotism. So in short, the northern poetic idiom had evolved to express loss and exile, and partition enhanced its resonance. So the poet Amrita Pritham, pictured here, she moved during partition from Lahore to the Indian side, and she expressed her anguish very famously in a poem that was titled Aj, Aj Akhan Varishanu. And Varisha, so what it means, as you see here, is today I tell Varisha, somehow speak for your grave. Varis Shah was the poet who wrote the Hiranja story. So she's invoking that, those uh, ep love epics, right, to understand what's going on now. Um, another poet, Sahir Ludhyanvi, pictured here, who was a Muslim, he was in Lahore in 1943. He was there in 1947. And then in 1949, he up and leaves, and he goes to, he winds up in Bombay, and he becomes a film lyricist. Um, working on films that, again, narrate love stories based on eternal division. Uh, this writer, Sadat Hassan Manto, left Bombay for Pakistan, uh, but it was like a very tortured decision for him, and he dramatized the absurdity of the choice before him in a story he wrote called Toba Tek Singh, and it ends with a deranged central character called Bishan Singh refusing to choose between these two countries. He's standing in the no man's land, and the two countries are depicted as lunatic asylums behind barbed wire. And in the end, he just dies in the no man's land between them. And Manto himself was very tormented about this decision, and he struggled with depression. He wound up in a mental asylum, and then alcoholism killed him. This poet, Josh Malihabadi, who was a He's the one with the mustache sitting there. Uh, he was a close friend of Nehru, the first Indian prime minister. He was the chief editor of the Indian government's um, official Urdu newspaper, but he could not decide what to do. Uh, he went back and forth, and he finally migrated to Pakistan in 1958, but he later regretted that and tried to come back to India. And uh, I mean, it was never sort of resolved happily. Some who had conviction about their decision lost it over time, winding up with a sort of resigned ambivalence accompanied often by a sense of transcendental connection across the border. Gandhi, before he died, uh, declared, I do not consider Pakistan and India as two different countries. If I have to go to Punjab, I'm not going to ask for a passport and I shall go walking. No one can stop me. He was not alone in insisting on continued connection that might render the border meaningless. Of course, this was denial, uh, a mechanism for coping with the trauma of partition, but it was also genuinely hopeful given the revolutionary energy still evident at the time. It's important to remember that through the end of 1948, uh, right in the middle of India, there was a massive communist rebellion going on in Hyderabad that the Indian army had to put down very forcefully, and then as soon as that's over, you have revolution in China. So it's really not clear that things are settled, the borders are settled in 1947. So this wounded optimism created the space for a post-partition self that could both encompass and transcend the new division, even perhaps the violence that had accompanied, that had accompanied it. And here I'm leaning a bit on the work of Amir Mufti. The Pakistani poet, Fez Ahmed Fez, pictured here with his wife Alice. Um, he expressed the condition of a self that's not at home with itself and yet aware that its feeling of incompleteness is the source of its movement and life. So I'll share with you just two lines from a 1970 poem of his, and please look at the English while I read the Urdu. Dur ja kar kareeb ho jitne, hum se kab tum kareeb the itne, ab na aoge tum na jaoge, vaslo hijra baham hue kitne. So separation and union are collapsed into one. Distance and nearness coexist. Self and other do not become one, but are simultaneously near and distant, sort of uncertain. The poet Jagannath Azad, pictured here, uh, this, this gentleman, uh, he migrated from Lahore to Delhi in 1947. 
And then he goes back to Pakistan for a visit in 1948. And when he's there, he writes this. So it remains his home. He, he's alienated, but he's not a guest. He's guest-like. So he's split into both host and guest. He's both at home and not at home. He's both desi and pardesi. So post-partition Urdu poetry continued even to invoke places across the border as if they're part of the same space, as if all are equally within reach of the poets who are writing this poetry on both sides. Pakistani poets continue to rely on the non-Islamic symbolism of um, idols, funeral pyres, um, things that are common to Hindu uh, practice, uh, because the ironic idiom of Urdu poetry depends on that. So partition was supposed to fulfill the religious narrative of Muslims virtuously abandoning a heathen land, hijrat, right? But in this poetry, the abandoned home is not depicted as a heathen land, but as a beloved that they are separated from. The idea of imaginatively transcending borders was a kind of reworking of that concept of birha. This poetic idiom was all about transcending worldly reality for something more meaningful. And it remains so popular because it resonates with the real experiences of millions of people. And I think you can probably tell intersecting and related stories about Bengali, Hindi, Punjabi, and other um, uh, literary traditions. I want to emphasize this is not a specialized intellectual history, but part of a very much a cultural mainstream. You can see similar themes in the films and plays that came out uh, that were talking about partition in sometimes oblique and, and different ways. But often there are stories of twins uh, separated uh, and uh, lost um, families, broken up by an earthquake. I mean, there are sort of these ways of alluding to the trauma of partition, even when it's not obvious, or uh, divar is the wall, uh, for instance. Um, and then, of course, in art as well, these are mourners, women whose faces are covered for you know, various reasons. Okay, so living contradiction is a means of superseding loss. Partition did not create coherent national selves so much as a population of divided selves. The exile, the refugee, the orphan, the converted, the abducted and reclaimed, all these survivors were in different ways split violently split selves. Later turmoil in Indian Punjab from the 1960s through the 2000s produced more stories of displacement, sharpening the image of the Punjabi as a sort of beloved Pradesi, not least because so many Punjabi writers and artists found refuge in the Bombay film industry where they popularized this image and the idea that love lies in separation. So displacement is central to Punjabi identity, just like it is to say Jewish identity or Armenian identity, but in a distinct way in that the Punjabi is aware of his own role in his tragic severance from his home and violent division of his homeland. His, and I do mean his, his is a self-imposed exile guiltily justified by one or another promise of modernity personal prosperity for economic migrants, national prosperity for partition refugees. So he self-consciously martyrs the homeland for the progress of its children, secure that in dutifully pursuing his worldly ends, he nevertheless maintains a timeless bond with that homeland, a bond that is, becomes more and more transcendental at each remove from the geopolitical reality of a place called Punjab. So here there's something going on that relates consciousness to conscience, generalizing it as a broader Punjabi cultural trait. The split self is a self, after all, that can watch itself, right? That's the foundation of most modern understandings of conscience, whether as an inner observer, inner voice, internal messenger, or simply the absence of a sense of a unitary self, from Hinduism to Islam to liberalism, we understand conscience as a capacity to disrupt selfhood in some way, as a splitting of the self into observer and observed. If we go back to Monday's lecture, that's exactly what Samuel Galton did when he was writing that defense, like looking at himself and analyzing himself as if he's another, right? And, oh dear. I have two pictures out of order. And you know, Gandhi was always the thing with the spinning wheel, right? Part of the, his um, interest in that was that if we our, absorb ourselves in craft, you 
you, you, your conscience and your consciousness both become clear in a different way. T.E. Lawrence, we talked about his attraction. He also was interested in craft with motorcycles and things like that, um, and going to the desert to lose him, his consciousness, right? And there's a, a sense I'm still working out how these things go together, but I feel like they do. Um, Colonialism and nationalism disrupt social and cultural relations, unleashing dynamics of inclusion and exclusion. They have historically been forces of violent displacement. And the consciousness they produce is complex. It's a house divided unto itself, struggling to encompass its complicity in these destructive dynamics. And if you think back to Wednesday's lecture and the British officers who were so empathetic that they felt they could think like an Arab, I mean, whatever is going on, psychically there is, is, I think, related to this. It is significant that unlike other instances of mass trauma, like the Holocaust or Hiroshima, uh, partition has not been formally memorialized till now. And I think this is partly because of widespread bad conscience. Those who are victims were also often perpetrators. And the imminent passing of that generation has unleashed a scramble to collect testimony and memorialize the event before it is too late. And there's a Berkeley-based organization that's doing much of this work called the Partition Archive. And they've done it with such sensitivity that I think this may finally enable a kind of reckoning with uh, conscience as well. And if you think about it, the intimate history of killing is difficult to write. Think about World War I. We have endless accounts of suffering in the trenches, but how many wrote about the equally common experience of killing? That was even more incommunicable than the suffering they experienced. As far as I know, it was only T.E. Lawrence who has given us an account of killing in World War I when he described uh, a massacre he took part in in the Palestine campaign. This is a still from the David Lean movie, if you recall, just the kind of almost intoxicated in, you know, in insanity of the, that moment, the way it's depicted in the film. Um, OK. To summarize, I'm not going to leave it on that picture. Um, the British Empire was not acquired. This is a summary of all three lectures, I hope. To summarize, the British Empire was not acquired in a fit of absence of mind, as some would like to say, but by minds committed to certain cultural notions and theories of history. A defining quality of the modern period is a self-conscious and worldly understanding of conscience shaped by a historical sensibility. Besides philanthropy, Galton's sense of history, his ideas about how, how context constrained his agency, helped ease his conscience as a Quaker gunmaker. British experts on the Middle East justified bombardment through a theory of cyclical and mythical Arabian history. The narrative of, of liberal empire soothed the British conscience in 1947. Paranoid narratives licensed violence among Punjabis and Bengalis, and then transcendental historical perspectives allowed Indians and Pakistanis to encompass that memory. So we're reflecting here on the metaphysics of historical thought, how a particular theory of history can influence our deeds by influencing our sense of agency and responsibility in shaping the world around us. So British, British um, sugar boycotters in the 18th century acted out uh, you know, the abolition movement acted out of an awareness that their agency as, as consumers contributed to the slave production of sugar. British imperialism itself emerged from well-meaning but destructive, ultimately, ultimately destructive faith in Britain's providential historical role in the world. If you believe that the proletariat makes history, you are going to act differently in your life from someone who believes that it is the alignment of the planets and the stars that shapes human action. Right? So the theory of history you have in your head affects your agency and conscience. The modern era is one in which men, and again, I mean men, increasingly conscious of their own agency as historical actors, try to shape world events according to certain historical scripts, whether as revolutionaries or conquerors or industrialists or settlers. The notions of progress that drove the spread of industrial capitalism, imperialism, and nationalism depended on an ability to suppress conscience by recourse to assumptions about race, religion, and culture culture, and dreams of utopic ends again and again justified horrific means. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I think I went a little bit over time. I apologize. But I'm happy to take your comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for that. If there are uh, questions in the audience, please um, raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. <clears throat> 
To what extent was Jinnah's uh, political aspirations driving the partition that came too fast and not very well done? Um, yeah, it's a, it's, he's such an interesting, complicated figure. Um, my own sense is I don't think he understood it as his personal political ambitions, but certainly uh, he made himself the protector of the interests of Indian Muslims. But my sense is that, I mean, he didn't, he didn't think he would need to even let go of his property in Bombay. His own daughter didn't move with him. He knew he was ill, and he died very soon after partition. So I, I'm not sure he, that the way partition worked out was anything like what he, he had in mind when he was bargaining for it, you know. Um, but he certainly did want to make sure that the Muslim minority in India had a seat at the table. But I, I don't, I doubt that the shape it eventually took, that, you know, that was what, what he actually desired. I mean, the way he um, spoke about partition afterward was it, it, not at all in a triumphalist way. He sounded so disappointed. Like, this is what we've got. Let's try to be happy with this. There was no sense that he had won, you know, when, when partition was settled. That's my sense. And I understand that uh, Gandhi was probably the father of modern India, correct? Pe people say that. I yeah. Mean, uh, did not want a partition. Uh, the uh, Hindu. He was a Hindu, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did not want a partition, but it was the factors uh, within that forced the, the that. Part, the Congress party more generally did, did not, uh, in the end, agreed to partition. In theory, they did not want to partition, but when it yeah. came down to doing the negotiations, that was the lesser evil to them. They did not want to compromise on the structure of the imp imperial state. They didn't want a more federal structure. They wanted a centralized, strong state. Whatever the British had, they, want, they wanted to inherit that. Uh, I, my parents migrated from India. To, from Delhi, actually, to Karachi. To Karachi. Okay. I was born in Karachi, but the stories that are the, the, the things that they've told me was that the reason Pakistan came into being is because the Muslims were the rulers for centuries through the Mughal Empire. Mm -hmm. And then when the British took over, they obviously played one against the other. But had the pa pa Muslims not separated as a separate country, economically, they would be dominated by the Hindus because they would have been a minority. And it was for more economic reasons that Pakistan came into being. And all of the other reasons were maybe also true, but most of it was driven by economic uh, success of the Muslim population. And when I look at it in Cleveland, I use the example, there are uh, maybe uh, 400 physicians from Pakistan. And there are maybe a handful of physicians that are Muslim I who see. are Pakistanis, who are I mean, who, who are, are Indian. Who Indian. I see. Yeah, and I see. so the education yeah. and all the discrimination that has gone on, that has proven them right. right. I would like right. to hear your thoughts. That's, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I have no doubt that there were people making those kind of arguments and that that is part of the concern of, you know, what will be the fate of this minority and somebody needs to speak for them. However, the way partition unfolded was so hasty and confusing, it's not clear that there were any really clear rational guiding principles behind it. I'm sure, though, that these concerns were part of the reasoning behind it. That said, in terms of solving that problem, there are still more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. And so, in a way, those Muslims are even worse off. They're even more of a minority. I, I mean, for, I don't want to undermine anyone's, uh, you know, your pride in their country and where they came from. But in terms of solving that problem of the economic status of Muslims, that did not get, in India, that did not get solved, right? Yeah. Um, I I'm wondering how how is it that there were two places like Pakistan and Bangladesh? <laughs> how is it that they're so far apart? That that could be thought of as a country? Yeah. Yeah. Just think, you have, just think to 19, 
1945 to 1949, and the whole nation state system is falling apart after World War II. There are refugees everywhere, all over Europe, all over the Middle East, different kinds of occupying forces. I mean, this is a time in which it didn't really seem likely that this system is nation state system is going to be the system. You have the Soviet Union, which is this other kind of empire. And so, I mean, it's a kind of a creative moment. And this is a kind of one of the creative things that came out of it, in a sense. Um, that's the way I would understand it very much contextually in that time. But it's, it's a weird, it's an experiment that then, um, you know, really, really challenged Pakistanis to say, what what is it that unifies these two places that are so distant. Had there, been, had there been more like Muslims living in Pakistan and in Bangladesh, was it because of populations that were already there? Or culture yeah, or? Yeah, so if you go back to that map of Punjab. Oh goodness, I showed you so many pictures. Where is it? Ah, OK. So you can see the western part of Punjab does have more Muslim majority areas. But there are Muslims throughout, and there are Hindus and Sikhs throughout as well. So it's a very, very mixed population. But you can, basically, these two provinces were split in half. Um, but it's not like the line matched any demographic reality. People moved to make the line match that. And then to even go back to your question, I mean, there, there was no expectation that people would move. This was not, people were not, sub in the, the plan did not include moving. People moved unexpectedly. These Jinnah Gandhi, no one knew that everybody is going to just move. And that's why the arrangements for refugees were so bad and so hasty and disorganized. So this is something that people on the ground were deciding to do. And only now, by collecting oral testimony, are we understanding the how people arrived at those decisions. So many people didn't know they were actually leaving for good. They buried their jewelry in the floor and the walls thinking they're coming back. They'll come back, right? But they didn't, right? I apologize if you gave this answer on Wednesday. I did one. No, oh, yeah. Here. What was the risk to England as a country if they didn't do the partition? What were they afraid of? Why did they have to do it so quickly? Oh, what I was saying about uh, a mistake with Indian Muslims would reverberate throughout the empire. Yes, they have, after World War I, become the ruler of the Middle East. And uh, they have this idea that, um, uh, that uh, Muslims will all band together against them if they make a mistake with Muslims in India, then the uh, Muslims in Iraq or Palestine or some other place will, will also rebel or be upset or take the side of Indian Muslims or something like that. That there's a big conspiracy of Muslims. Oh, uh, no, I haven't seen. I don't. I don't think it was, they need, I mean, I think they're so paranoid about Muslims, they don't even think they have to be geographically concentrated. I mean, Muslims can communicate telepathically, <laughs> according to, right? It's paranoia. It's not like a real thing. Uh, this was a very informative you know, talk, for sure. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to understand, like, how do you make this connection between what you call Biraha Bir and uh -huh. And you know, partition because Virhal yeah. can also be read as you know, even in Mira Bhajan's or yeah. in Sufi poetry, yeah. and that dates back to a much earlier tradition, mm -hmm. right? So you know, if you could shed some light on yeah, I was trying to say. I'm sorry, it was very brief, but I was trying to say that this older poetic tradition uh, gets mobilized in a new way, gets used in a new way uh, as people are trying to deal with colonialism, but then especially when they're dealing with partition, right? And I think poets like Fez Amand Fez in particular did this a lot. Like, can you be uh, a part and yet not be? Like, it can be meaningless in a sense, and you're still on the same journey, and you still have your friends that you had, and maybe the border is a bridge and not a divider, ideas like that. So they're, they're using that old trope which is a very 
spiritual trope in a very worldly kind of context. Uh, intrude uh, in the more formal part of the presentation. I first want to, on behalf of the university and the Center for the Humanities, uh, thank Professor Satya for a wonderful series of talks, for lunches, for meeting with students, for sharing her time and her expertise with all of us. And I'd like to invite you to join me in giving her a rousing hand. Thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you so much.